So um, I'm going to speak uh, first for a little bit on, uh, as a philosopher, uh, I don't necessarily have much expertise in the precise details of what's going on today, uh, but I do a lot of work in intellectual history, um, and these debates over free trade are not new. Uh, so I hope to shed a little bit of historical context on what's going on today, uh, primarily by talking about uh, Adam Smith uh, and his critique of English mercantilism in the 17th century. And I hope you see as we go along, um, there are a lot of common themes. Uh, not much has changed in the last several hundred years. So for the greater part of human history, uh, intellectuals and politicians alike have looked upon international trade with a skeptical eye. The Roman poet Horace worried that trade by sea would open up his country to the corrupting influence and morals of barbarians. And St. Augustine believed that trade endangered the soul by risking the temptations of sin, covetousness, and fraud. But by far the most famous and influential criticisms of trade arose during the 16th and 17th centuries in the writings of the English mercantilists. These writings, which appeared mostly in pamphlet form and were written largely by English merchants and government officials, argued that open trade was dangerous to the economic health of the nation that engaged in it. Now, it's hard to say much in terms of, sort of overall themes or systematic arguments of the mercantilists. They were a diverse lot uh, and uh, more concerned with addressing public policy issues than laying out an economic treatise. Still, uh, at the risk of oversimplification, we can identify one of the main themes of the mercantilist literature as the idea that exports were good and imports were bad, especially with respect to manufactured goods. Uh, a country that exports manufactured goods, the mercantilists held, brings in wealth from the rest of the world, and the manufacturing involved in producing those goods provides jobs for the domestic economy. Imports, in contrast, send wealth out of the country and provide jobs for people elsewhere, including one's political rivals. So it was against this mercantilist backdrop that Adam Smith wrote an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, published in 1776. Now, as the title, the full title of that volume suggests, the main question of the book uh, really consists of two parts. Uh, first, what is the nature of the cause of wealth of nations? Or, sorry, what is the nature of the wealth of nations? That is, what is it? to be wealthy, what does that mean? And second, what is the cause of the wealth of nations? Why are some nations wealthy and others not? Now, in answer to the first question, Smith held that wealth consists of the goods and services that make our lives better. Not money, but the things that money can buy. Now, one immediate implication of this recognition is that so-called negative balance of trade, more imports than exports, doesn't necessarily mean that a country is losing wealth. Imports cost money, of course, but insofar as we're getting something in exchange for that money, there's every reason to think that we come out at least even from the exchange in terms of net wealth. Smith's answer to the second question comprises the more famous and more important contribution of his book. Uh, and mercifully, he gives us a short version of his answer to that second question in the very first line of the book. The greatest improvements in the productive powers of labor, Smith writes, seems to have been the effect of the division of labor. By allowing individuals to specialize in what they do best, and by specializing to become even better at it, the division of labor not only improves the skill and dexterity of labors, but makes possible the phenomenon of exchange, in which I meet my needs by selling the goods or services I make in exchange for the goods and services of others. I can live a much more comfortable life by spending all my time producing philosophy lectures and then paying other people to bake my bread, make my clothes, and build my iPhone than if I tried to do all of those things by myself. Now, of course, without an extensive division of labor, the very idea of iPhones and most of the other luxury goods that we take for granted these days would be utterly inconceivable. And the word extensive here is important. After setting out why the division of labor is important, Smith immediately noted that the division of labor depends on the extent of the market. Sorry, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Now, to see what Smith meant by this, consider what the division of labor would look like with an isolated family of four. If that family had to produce everything it needed and couldn't purchase anything from anyone else, it would have to produce its own crops, raise its own livestock, build and maintain its own house, cobble its own shoes, and so on. In a situation like this, you simply couldn't have afford to have any of the four family members specialize in just one thing. Everyone would have to be a generalist. In a small town, 
with many more people than a single family, things are immeasurably better. With enough people with whom to trade, a person can, able, can afford to support themselves by, say, running the local restaurant. In a large town, you can have many such persons and even further specializations. So you can have not only people running restaurants, but people running vegan Indo-European restaurants and finding enough of a market among the large population to support themselves by this highly specialized form of production. So Smith's basic case for international trade is that it allows for a more extensive division of labor, which in turn allows for further specialization, further increases in productivity, and great ability to obtain the goods and services we want at the lowest price. Trade for Smith, whether domestic or international, is really best thought of as simply a different way of producing the things that we want. He writes, Oops. if a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy it of them with some part of the produce of our own industry employed in a way in which we have some advantage. Now, tariffs or other restrictions on trade reduce aggregate wealth by preventing consumers from buying goods at the cheapest available source. As such, they are economically inefficient. They shrink the size of the overall pie from which we must eat. Here's Smith again. The industry of the country is thus turned away from more to less advantage, advantageous employment, and the exchange value of its annual produce, instead of being increased according to the intention of the lawgiver, must necessarily be diminished by every such regulation. Now, of course, it's true that tariffs usually benefit somebody. They benefit some particular industry or some sector of the domestic economy. Tariffs on steel, for instance, benefit the domestic steel industry by making its foreign competitors more expensive and encouraging consumers to buy from the domestic producers instead. But one of Smith's key insights and what one of the things that really set him apart from earlier economic literature on this point was to frame the question of the impact of tariffs in terms of overall national wealth, to focus on the entire economy and not just that sector of the economy most directly and visibly affected by the tariff. And on those terms, because tariffs simply raise the price at which we must purchase the goods we want, tariffs have an overall negative economic impact, Smith held. Okay, it's difficult to overstate the importance of Smith's economic critique of mercantilism. Uh, in undermining the mercantilist preference for imports over exports and showing that open trade increases overall economic wealth, Smith established a strong, not, not indefeasible, but strong presumption in favor of international trade, which has dominated the economic profession for over two centuries. But it's important to note that Smith's critique of protectionism was not merely economic. Smith was, after all, not everyone knows this, but Smith was a professor of moral philosophy uh, at the University of Glasgow. And the question of how trade is to be conducted between nations is one with serious moral consequences. For Smith, after all, saw that trade restrictions on trade tariffs don't simply shrink the pie of national wealth. It also affects who gets a bigger piece of that pie and who gets a smaller piece. A tax on imported steel produces real and easily perceivable benefits to those domestic producers of steel who are being undercut by cheaper foreign competition. The costs of the tariff, on the other hand, are much harder to perceive, but no less real and indeed much more widespread among the domestic consumers of steel who must now, after all, pay a higher price. In this way, tariffs benefit a small number of producers at the expense of a great number of consumers. And Smith felt this is exactly the opposite of what government policy ought to do. You know, Smith again. Consumption, he wrote, is the sole end and purpose of all production. And the interests of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. Right? The point of the steel industry isn't to provide jobs. The point of the steel industry is to make steel that we can then use. Smith recognized that tariffs are, in effect, a form of theft or legalized plunder, as the later French economists of the 19th century would call it, whereby a powerful few use their political influence to steal from the less politically well-organized many. And this, Smith held, runs absolutely contrary to the purpose of legitimate government, 
a purpose which he summed up as the obvious and simple system of natural liberty in which every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, is left perfectly free to pursue his own interests, his own way, and to bring both his industry and capital into competition with those of any other men or order of men. But while rent-seeking and protectionist policies may be immoral, according to Smith, they're not exactly surprising either. This is one of my favorite quotes from Smith. People of the same trade, he wrote, seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Still rings true. Smith saw both the virtues and the vices of a market system. Free trade and the division of labor had the power to create tremendous wealth to the extent that, as he noted, even a simple working man in Scotland could afford a woolen coat that is the product of countless hours of other workers' labor, including not only the shepherds, spinners, and weavers, but the merchants who sell it, the shippers who transport it, the miners who collect the ore that is used to make the shepherd shears, and so on. But at the same time, Markets are prone to manipulation by rent seekers who seek to use their political power to distort markets to their own end. And sometimes markets fail of their own accord. Smith saw a place for government in the elimination of market externalities and the provision of public goods. And even the great principle of free trade, Smith thought, was not without exceptions. And I'd be curious to hear what some of the other panelists think about how Trump tariffs may or may not fall under some of one or both of these exceptions. The first involved cases in which quote, some particular sort of industry is necessary for the defense of the country. So industries that pertain to national defense um, or in our vital economic security, Smith thought we can protect those companies from being undermined by foreign competition by using tariffs, since after all, political stability is a higher order uh, value than uh, mere opulence, he wrote. The second involved the equalization of tax treatment in cases where domestic goods are subject to taxes, not levied on any foreign goods. That, he thinks, just levels the playing field rather than giving domestic industries an artificial monopoly uh, over foreign comp competition. Finally, uh, Smith thought that retaliatory tariffs, tariffs issued in response to another country's initiation of tariffs, could sometimes be justified, but only, only with the end of pressuring the other side to drop the original tariff. This recourse should be undertaken cautiously, Smith wrote, and I'll leave you with this thought since it seems especially relevant to our current situation today. When there is no probability that any such repeal can be procured, it seems a bad method of compensating the injury done to certain classes of our people to do another injury ourselves, not only to those classes, but to almost all the other classes of them. And I'll leave you with that. If you've been paying attention to the news, you may have noticed that trade is somewhat of a hot topic right now. And we'll get into the various disputes and we'll talk about the impacts and how they affect different groups of people. But I think it's important to start with uh, talking about how the mainstream view of trade differs from the academic view. So this graph shows uh, the approval rating of trade over time in the US. And then the results are disaggregated by political affiliation. And what we see here is two really important things or re really interesting things. First, before 2016, you see that is trade good or bad, the approval rating of trade is somewhere between 50 and 60%. Um, but then we have this inflection point at 2016, and suddenly there's a spike in the approval rating of trade. And the reason this is interesting is because up until 2016, both major political parties were very committed to reducing trade barriers. And it wasn't until you had an administration that was more vocal about protectionism, that we saw this quick spike. On the academic side, you would see nothing like that. So for decades, really, if you were to do a similar poll among economists, the approval rating would be pretty much 100%. And that's for a multitude of reasons, which some of which Matt touched on. But for firms, you're getting access to more markets and maybe cheaper inputs. For consumers, competition is going to exert downward pressure on prices, and you have access to a wider variety of goods. And there's also a national security argument whereby you could say 
if I have a vested economic interest with some other country, I'm less likely to enter into aggressions with them. But this doesn't mean that there aren't any drawbacks. So we want to see fair trade so that different firms and consumers are playing on a level playing field. And we also understand that there will be winners and there will be losers. So from the academic perspective, we may say the net benefit of trade is positive. So we just need to think about ways to potentially compensate losers. But if I'm in the mainstream and I'm seeing communities where tons of firms are going out of business and an entire industry might be wiped out, then in that scenario, trade might be a four-letter word. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind when we're thinking about how people are viewing trade and the arguments that they're making for and against it. All right, put all of that to the side. Current trade disputes. There are a lot of them, and they all have different origin stories. I'll let David talk about NAFTA. But what's really remarkable about, remarkable about all these trade disputes is the sheer number of ways it's being used in each of these cases. So in one case, it's to uh, tilt the playing field in favor of certain sectors in the American economy. In another case, we see trade policy being used instead of diplomacy to try and extract some kind of political win. And then in the bottom case, it's dissatisfaction with the global landscape of trade altogether. And really, you could have separate panels on all of these different disputes, but given my background, given Allison's background, we're going to focus on China. So the United States trade representative, Robert Lighthizer, has outlined multiple grievances that they have with Chinese trade policies. And for the most part, these cover three types of trade practices. It's uh, forced technological transfer, non-tariff barriers to trade, and direct government involvement in market outcomes. And those are all legitimate grievances. A less legitimate grievance is one that's been cited quite often by uh, the president as well as his director of trade policy, is about the trade deficit between China and the US, which again, Matt has already touched on. So a trade deficit isn't a bad or a good thing. It's just a thing, right? It means that the value of exports from to a particular country is less than the value of imports from that country. And so it's not a profit or loss the way you would think about it with firms. If anything, it's saying the US is a high consumption country and it's a net buyer of capital goods, for instance. But we have our legitimate grievances. We have our less legitimate grievances. We use all of these motivations, and the US says, these are the reasons why we're going to impose tariffs on China. And this is a little bit old, because this shows the goods that were affected by the first phase of tariffs. There was a second phase that happened two weeks ago. But uh, we see the types of goods that are affected. It's washing machines, solar panels, steel and aluminum, um, things of that nature. Now, you may ask me, how does this impact US consumers? And the answer is, it depends. So generally speaking, you may see an increase in the price level across all states. But different states rely more heavily on exports to China in different ways, or trade with China in different ways. And so what this is telling me is that if I'm in Tennessee or California, maybe Illinois, this trade war might affect me more adversely than it would affect me if I were in Montana or North Dakota, right? And also, buried within this is that different sectors are affected differently by the trade wars. So you have to keep these things in mind when we're talking about the effects. But that's one side of the picture. It's a trade war. So you need an enemy. Your enemy can retaliate. And that's exactly what China has done. China's retaliated by putting tariffs on these US exports. And so if you're a manufacturer of motorcycles or helicopters or cars, maybe you're in agriculture, maybe you're in the seafood industry, um, you're going to see some pretty major ill effects. So I mentioned the trade deficit, but I didn't talk about the magnitude of it. So the trade deficit uh, between US and China is $375 billion. 
And so in relation to other countries, you see that the U.S.-China trade deficit is more than five times the size of the Mexico-U.S. trade deficit. Again, this is neither a good or bad thing necessarily. It's just the state of the international landscape. But what this number buries is the bilateral linkages between these two countries. Because not only is China a major <clears throat> import source for the United States, but it's also the third largest destination for U.S. exports. And that's the reason why these, this trade war can really get out of control very quickly, because this is a major partner and a major source. And so you rise up, you increase tariffs, it's going to affect both sets of consumers and producers negatively. Okay, I'll hand it over. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Matt, for organizing uh, this great event. Uh, it's great to learn from my colleagues in the business school. Uh, thank you for uh, the fantastic student presentation, at least some of whom I think are uh, indentured servants or forced uh, into being here by the virtue of the fact that I have class right now. Uh, so this is, uh, some of you are from my class. Uh, but let's jump ahead. Uh, we've heard 2016 uh, was a remarkable year uh, in a number of ways. Uh, it was remarkable uh, for me as a person who studies Mexico in that for the 150 or so plus years that we've had a relationship with Mexico, Mexico has never before been the center of a U.S. presidential campaign. No U.S. president before 2016 ever focused on Mexico as a major part of his agenda. Um, and fortunately for those of us who traffic in Mexico, uh, it's been a bonanza, right? Uh, Trump, uh, Donald Trump, if anything, uh, did more to sell copies of my book with Dr. Edmonds Poli uh, than anything. So he's creating jobs uh, from, the, <laughs> from day one. Uh, but one of the things th that he said that stood out, aside from, you know, Mexicans are terrible people, rapists and criminals, uh, aside from the idea that there are bad hombres on the U.S.-Mexico border. One of the key focuses of Trump's campaign was this issue of trade. And from uh, the, I think it was the second debate, uh, he said, you know, NAFTA is the worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed in this country, uh, which is a pretty bold uh, statement from President Trump. Uh, when Trump won, uh, the idea of bad things happening in Mexico was actually, uh, as, as a result of his election, was, was pretty rampant. Uh, and then the days following Trump's election, we actually saw uh, the Mexican peso take a huge hit because people thought, wow, you know, things are going to go really badly for Mexico um, under the Trump administration. And so we saw some negative effects. Um, I'll ask uh, Austin. Jump ahead. And, and indeed, one of the first things that Trump did in January 2017 was to issue a series of executive orders that had to do with Mexico. On the 25th, he uh, sent one out about um, uh, the border, about securing the border. Uh, and two days before that, two days after he was inaugurated, uh, he uh, signed an executive order saying, we're going to renegotiate the North American Free Trade Agreement, the worst deal ever, right? Um, let's move on. Um, that was followed. Uh, by a series of tense exchanges between President Trump and President Enrique Peña Nieto, the sitting president of Mexico, um, over whether or not Mexico was going to pay for the wall that Trump has promised um, and over whether or not they were actually going to get together and meet. Uh, historically, over the last 100 plus years, the U.S. president has made his first foreign visit um, and first visitors received as heads of state uh, to the United States, either Canada or Mexico, our two neighboring countries. Uh, however, under for the first time ever, for the first time since presidents have, have been meeting, uh, and prime ministers in, in Canada, um, for the first time ever, our president has not met his counterpart in Mexico, uh, or uh, his counterpart from Mexico. So this is a really big shift in U.S.-Mexican relations. Uh, they didn't meet because they had a tiff uh, by telephone and by tweet. And so th these two presidents have not gotten along. Uh, that's important context. I think the thing we need to understand is that this 
this new administration through uh, the whole U.S.-Mexico relationship, um, and arguably much more than that, uh, all of U.S. foreign policy into a state of disarray. Uh, nobody has really understood what's going to happen. What are the implications of Trump's policies? So um, we're looking at an exciting exciting new time in, uh, in U.S. international relations, U.S. Uh, foreign relations. And if I can ask Austin to advance. There are a lot of questions, right? Particularly with Mexico, you know, what, is this, what does the future hold? Are we going to get a new NAFTA agreement? Uh, are we going to see uh, a wall built? There's all kinds of questions, um, not all of which we can get into today. Um, but the, you guys have the, are, are so fortunate, I think, in that you are living in an historical moment. Uh, the things that you guys are witnessing right now, you will talk about for a long time, long after the war. You got, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. L but long, in the future, you'll be, you'll be talking about uh, the things you're seeing now. So it's good that you're here and that you're paying attention and trying to get up to speed on what's going on. Let's move ahead. I, I wanna say a couple things about US-Mexico relations. One, um, these are two countries that have historical um, animosities. Um, these are two countries which today are asymmetrical in, um, uh, well, they've historically been asymmetrical. It's just that since 1848, we have been the larger country uh, up until 1848 and the US-Mexico War where we basically won, let's call it won, a big chunk of Mexico's territory. Um, Mexico was actually larger uh, than the United States. And uh, somehow, um, thanks to U.S. expansion, et cetera, um, we've, we've reduced Mexico to about half the size that it once was. Um, they're a little bit bitter about that, as one might imagine. In uh, Mexican history textbooks, they make note of the fact that where we're sitting right now, this place, San Diego, is actually, or historically was, part of Mexico, right? So there are some, there, there are longstanding tensions. But like good neighbors, we've gotten over those tensions very significantly. And since uh, uh, then, we've found ways to become much closer together, particularly in the last 25 uh, years or so, we've seen a, a, a rapid rapprochement between the United States and Mexico uh, very significantly through things like the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, Mexico, up until the 1980s, was a very insular country, economically speaking, uh, did not allow uh, foreign companies to invest uh, as easily. In Mexico, as they might elsewhere, uh, there were uh, huge tariffs on uh, external goods. And the 1980s, for a variety of reasons, Mexico really opened uh, to uh, working with other countries, particularly the United States. And we saw trade between Mexico and the United States actually increase very dramatically in the course of the 1980s. Um, so much so that for the first time ever, um, after having negotiated an agreement with Canada, uh, the United States and Canada agreed to a major free trade agreement that would bring in a developing country into a, an, an economic arrangement with two already substantially developed countries. Uh, I think one of the things that's very important to recognize is how uh, important this agreement has been in trying to um, bring North America up to um, a, an economic level uh, of parity. Uh, it's a huge, NAFTA has been a huge experiment in trying to find ways to promote economic development in, in, uh, uh, in Mexico. So I, I think um, as, as we've talked about, um, thinking about NAFTA uh, and thinking about free trade generally inspires either uh, a lot of enthusiasm or a lot of bitterness. Um, for, depending on your perspective, depending on where you sit um, economically, whether you have a blue collar job or a white collar job, uh, whether you're from California or Tennessee, is going to have a lot of impact on whether you think NAFTA was a good thing or a bad thing. So. Um, Let's move ahead. 
The first thing I'll say is that what NAFTA did, the important thing that we all need to recognize about what NAFTA did is that first and foremost, it established a, a, a system of tariff reductions over the course of an extended period of time, 15, 20 years, uh, basically. It wasn't until 2008 that we got to the point where all three countries had lowered tariffs essentially on, on uh, goods traded uh, across all three countries to zero. Uh, the reason we phased tariffs out relatively slowly was to make sure that uh, no particular industry or set of producers would be harmed by uh, the, the rapid introduction of competition into uh, their, their economies. A couple other things that NAFTA did, uh, just interestingly, not only did it reduce tariff barriers, but it also established some important rules. For example, rules of origin about how much of a particular good, uh, which would be eligible for these tariffs, uh, how much an import had to have in terms of content manufactured in North America. So when we import, say, um, you know, it, uh, the example was given before of an iPhone, when we import a, an auto part or um, a television from um, Mexico, there's a rule about whether those goods are going to be eligible for these tariffs, uh, depending on how much of the, that good is produced in the United States, Canada, uh, or Mexico. And the rule is right now, 65%, 65, six, sorry, 62.5% of a, a good that's eligible for these tariffs has to come from North America. Um, there are other things about the North American Free Trade Agreement. It's 2,000 pages long. It's got 22 chapters, uh, eight different sections. It's, an, it's a huge, sprawling agreement. Um, but for example, one of the things is that um, all three countries have to treat each other as the most favored nation. Uh, NAFTA establishes first uh, most favored nation status so that if suddenly Mexico were to make a better deal with Guatemala, um, all, three all three countries in North America would have the same tariff levels uh, with, um, with, with Guatemala. So there are a number of interesting aspects of NAFTA that we can't get into. Let's move ahead. In terms of results, one of the things that we've seen during the NAFTA era is a dramatic increase, a threefold increase in total volume of trade between uh, all three North American countries, between Mexico, Canada, uh, these are uh, US trade volumes with Mexico and Canada, um, both in terms of imports and exports. We've seen a huge amount of economic growth in, in the form of trade between these three countries. Uh, and that's generally been a good thing. Uh, moving on. Um, we've also seen Mexico and Canada re uh, retain their positions as top trading partners. These are, uh, along with China, our three top trading partners in the world. Um, we buy uh, and sell, well, we, we buy and sell more goods among these three countries uh, than any other countries in the world, uh, by far, uh, as was pointed out earlier. The other thing is, as, um, uh, as Dr. Ma pointed out, we're not really that dependent on our partners. Um, we, we are not dependent on them for our exports. Um, in fact, both Canada and Mexico depend on the United States for over three quarters of their trade, uh, three quarters of their exports. In other words, if we were to suddenly shut off trade, it would hurt a lot more Mexican exporters than it would U.S. exporters. Um, so we have some leverage. We're in a position, a favored position in this asymmetrical relationship. Um, I won't go into great detail here because I, I know we're running short on time, um, but this gives you an uh, illustration of some of the kinds of things that we buy and sell. Um, uh, there's a lot of motor, motor vehicle uh, manufacturing and, and cross-production across the, the two economies. Uh, there's also a lot of electronics uh, manufacturing and so on. Um, but overall, we're talking about the world's largest trading zone, uh, largest free trading zone. You've got... Um, over $500 billion in trade uh, in any given year, half a trillion of trade uh, uh, between these three countries, which themselves constitute an economic area collectively of over $20 trillion. We make up most of that. We're something like $15, uh, $16 trillion uh, of an economy, so it doesn't take a whole lot to, to get to 20. Uh, but the point is, this is an incredibly economically robust region. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 
It's true, though, that we have a trade deficit. And similar to the circumstance that uh, we saw before, this trade deficit is a complicated issue. 40% uh, uh, of the content of any uh, of goods, generally speaking, that we import from Mexico are actually content from US producers. Um, and so when we look at those raw numbers of the trade deficit, we see, yes, there's a, a very significant $60 billion trade deficit with, Can with Mexico, $20 billion trade deficit with, uh, with Canada. But again, in the grand scheme, we have to remember that uh, this is a small fraction of all U.S. trade. And in fact, if we go further, you know, uh, here's Canada and Mexico in the grand scheme. Here's China in the grand scheme, and here's the here's the rest, right? We have a huge trade deficit, period, um, and it's not clear that Canada or Mexico are necessarily uh, the real problem. And as Dr. Ma pointed out, uh, even when we parse these numbers further, there are there's a lot more going on when we actually look at the value added in trade. Um, move ahead. So the big question or debate about uh, NAFTA's effects uh, has to do with the effect on jobs. Uh, a lot of people did lose jobs, particularly in the manufacturing sector, um, over the last 20, 25 years um, as a result of economic integration and increasing uh, uh, mobility of capital uh, and the ability to take your factories to lots of different places, including Mexico, China, and elsewhere. Uh, but the uh, some recent studies in the last five, 10 years have really tried to parse out to what extent the job losses that we've seen in uh, the roughly 5 million uh, manufacturing jobs we've seen lost in the United States is attributable to um, basically uh, the shift in manufacturing to move uh, production elsewhere uh, versus other considerations like technology. Uh, and the consensus among economists, uh, folks like Gordon Hansen up at UCSD, seems to be that we are that, that the much larger share of job losses in manufacturing in the United States has to do with losing our jobs to robots, not losing our jobs to Mexicans. Um, so one of the things that we have to take into consideration is the, the, um, the role of technology here. Eventually, most of us, except for professors, will lose our jobs to robots. Um, so hopefully, um, hopefully that's true for the professor. Um, let's move ahead one more. Um, and it's also important to recognize that a large number of jobs um, actually uh, depend on NAFTA, right? In lots of different places around the country, Mexico is the number one or number two trading partner of that state. Uh, and so to the extent that we do care about export jobs, um, exports to Mexico and Canada, our two largest destination countries for exports, uh, are, are quite, Im quite important. Um, so let's talk in for like two minutes about renegotiating NAFTA. Um, what's happened over the course of the last year has been really fascinating to watch politically, right? Um, it was uh, in June of this year, actually, sorry, July of this year, that we started to see uh, a shift in the way the NAFTA negotiations worked. It was actually July 3rd that President Trump called the newly elected president-elect of Mexico, a guy named Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and said, hey, now that I don't have to deal with Enrique Peña Nieto, what do you think about splitting the negotiations? And I'll just negotiate with you directly in a bilateral fashion, and I'll take care of my business with Canada on the side. Now, politically, that's, that's appealing to actually lots of people. To President Trump, it's appealing because he gets to divide and conquer, right? There's different issues that Canada uh, is concerned about, lumber um, and um, uh, some, some other important issues. Sorry. Dairy. Dairy? Dairy? Yeah. Dairy? Sure, dairy. Uh, sorry, I thought you said Derek. I was like, who's Derek? No, <laughs> um, no uh, uh, there, there are is different issues for Canada than there are for Mexico. Um, Wages are a bigger issue in negotiations with Mexico. We're worried about the fact that Mexican, uh, the Mexican minimum wage is about six or seven dollars a day, uh, and so there, it's a much bigger source of competition for U.S. labor. Um, so Trump likes it. Enrique Peña Nieto actually likes the idea because he wants to achieve something before he uh, ends his term on December 1st, 2018. So he's like, hey, if I can renegotiate NAFTA in some way, that could be a win for my government. And people say, hey, Enrique did 
the, the, the NAFTA 2.0. And then for a new incoming president of Mexico, the idea of splitting the negotiations and getting everything taken care of before he takes office is a really good idea because then he doesn't have to deal with it. Uh, and it doesn't become a political hot potato in Mexico. So those are some of the political in issues and incentives for why we're seeing this accelerated effort to get NAFTA done before December. Um, now, um, Canada might not like it so much. There's lots of reasons we could go into there. But the, the two things that we've seen in just in the last week, right? I, I had to check what's going on with NAFTA the hour before this discussion because like we're down to the wire. The negotiations were supposed to be completed over the next 48 hours. They've given them till Sunday. Um, but the, we've had this sliding timeline, so it's been really difficult to keep track. But here's what we know about what's anticipated from uh, what Trump is calling the US-Mexico trade agreement. Um, and basically what we know is that we would see an increase in uh, the rules of origin from 60, oh, sorry, uh, let's, let's jump ahead, uh, from 60, 2.5% to 75% for trucks, cars, engines, auto parts. Um, there'd basically be a shift in the rules of origin saying we want to squeeze out foreign producers uh, from that, that are supplying um, exporters in Mexico or supplying exporters in Canada who are sending their goods to the United States. Um, the idea is let's make most of our manufacturing come from North America. Uh, or from the countries that are party to the U.S.-Mexico trade agreement, which are now just two countries. Right? The other thing uh, that's kind of important is that there would be new content rules for certain products uh, to have, including automobiles, more U.S. steel, more U.S. aluminum, um, and more U.S. produced auto parts, chemicals, and other auto, uh, industrial products. Um, and lastly, this is a really interesting one, there'd be a requirement that 40 to 45 percent of auto manufactured goods sent to the United States have to have labor uh, uh, arrangements that pay more than $16 an hour. Right? So they want to basically see upward uh, a shift in the, the labor costs in Mexico, which will hopefully help to reduce the downward pressure on labor costs in the United States. Um, to the extent that you're afraid of losing your job in the manufacturing sector in the United States to a Mexican, um, it's because um, you know, labor is so much cheaper there. And so you, as a worker, might be willing to negotiate a lower wage. So it's actually not one of the things that people complain about is that maybe NAFTA has actually pushed down wages in the United States and, and free trade generally. So this is where we are. I'm going to stop uh, after the next slide. One more slide, because this is my concluding slide. Um, so the thing that we have to think about is there's, there's lots of ways that Donald Trump has sort of thrown uh, the, our relationship with Mexico and our relationship with other countries into disarray. Um, I, I think... The only question is how quickly he can get some of these things done uh, before November, uh, when we have a new government in, uh, or a potentially uh, change in US government in Congress uh, through the, the uh, elections, and whether those changes will be ratified by the next Congress. Because whatever deal we sign, we're going to have to get it ratified. Um, and then also, what changes might take place in other countries like Mexico, uh, uh, which will have a new president starting December 1st. So there's a lot, still a lot more questions, I think, than answers about where our future is headed under our esteemed leader. So anyway, that's it for me.